Stand here so people can see you. Okay, please Hi, I'm Emily. I work here at the Postal Museum. I work in education and I run the um, early elementary school program. Okay. Um, so we're here to talk about Magnifier, which is the app that we create with the help of Quattro Foil who's here to help us um, explain a little bit about the process that it took to make it all happen. Um, I'll start off by talking about why we decided we needed this app. Um, I was added to this exhibit team for the China um, Pacific Exchange U.S. and China mail exhibit. Um, and it's all about China and U.S. and how their relationship and how um, it's explained through commerce, culture, and community. So those relationships together, utilizing philately or stamps and letters and that kind of thing. Um, and when I got to the team in late October, due to some changes in staff. Uh, I was presented with this idea and um, six target audiences, and three of which have to do with families. Unfortunately, by the time I got there, the budget had been cut, and the one major educational tool, which was a talkback board, had been removed from the project. And just the content in itself and the way it's presented wasn't very as family friendly as it could have been. So uh, from my perspective, it wasn't really meeting the audience's needs. So we decided to talk about what could we do instead? And um, in the meanwhile, we had an intern who was on board who was very interested in this whole process of utilizing apps and alternate reality, augmented reality to communicate things in a different way. Do you want to talk a little bit about Clara? Sure. Yep, so I had brought on an intern, Clara Everhart, and um, she has a theater background and is involved in real um, spatial engagement of historic themes. And um, she and I were brainstorming about ways in which we could make the, um, the train car specifically uh, a more emotional experience for our visitors um, and how we could connect with them emotionally. And, um, you know, she had initially thought of lots of things with facilitated volunteers and staff, and I was like, no, 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 <laughs> um, because we didn't have the staffing to support that. Um, and so she approached me about using augmented reality. Um, and so all of a sudden I was like, well, hmm, that's a possibility. And I think the very next day we called Mark Retzfelder over and said, tell us what you know about augmented reality. Um, and to see whether or not her idea um, could be something that we could implement in parallel with mm -hmm. Emily kind of figuring out what she could do with the China exhibit. Yeah, and a big part of that was that um, due to the contract that we have with our designers, I couldn't change anything inside the exhibit. We can add anything in there. We couldn't put any text or we talked about having just some tables set up so we could have some family interactive activities going on, but it was kind of all shut down because of the contract that we had at that time. 
Um, so whatever we had that we were going to do inside that exhibit had to be completely mobile, and it could be taken in, taken out, and you know, really as um, as little to do with you know, manipulating the exhibit as possible. Which is why we went to the app um, and we got Quatrefoil involved. I don't know if Quatrefoil would like to come up, the representatives from Quatrefoil, to talk a little bit about um, the conversations that we had and what, how we ended up on the app that we, Mateo as the, the option. And yeah, stand in front of the camera here. Okay. <laughs> Good, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Bernard Muller. I'm with Quatrefoil. I look after our multimedia group. And uh, this I'm is Jane. Levine. Uh, Jane is our senior multimedia developer. So uh, we were obviously quite thankful to uh, uh, thankful for for uh, being invited to help uh, with uh, creating the uh, Magnify R app. And when we started uh, to have this conversation with the Postal Museum. Um, I think you guys have done some research on possible augmented reality platforms and suggested some, and that's where we kind of picked it up on a technical end, uh, just selecting the right um, augmented reality platform for us to use. So there were a few uh, contenders in the running. You suggested uh, Kachum and and uh, and uh, um, or Asma. and so by researching that, we we learned a few. Um, interesting facts about each one of the apps that helped us decide. So Erasma, for example, is a very good um, augmented reality platform. It's, for this purpose, prohibitively expensive. The licensing deal, I think, started something at $30,000 a year. So uh, for that reason, we just uh, like we liked it, the technical capabilities of it, but we discarded it just for cost reasons. Um, Kachum was another platform that you guys uh, suggested. We looked into that as well. So uh, when you do augmented reality apps, um, there's processing that's going on that compares the camera view that the, uh, that the device sees with the, the pre-selected target image. Um, Kachum does this all on their server. So you have to have a live link uh, from the device to the server all the time. And when we tested that, it worked, but we found that there's a certain latency there that you get by just like having the recognition being performed on the server. And then that made the app sluggish and kind of slow. So we went and researched some other apps, and we, uh, we found one that's called Meta.io. So the Magnify R app that you see and that you can use and that you can download is based on the Meta.io um, augmented reality engine. Um, it had a number of advantages. Um, one of the advantages was that the processing is done locally on the device. And when we tested it, we found that the recognition was quite accurate, very accurate, it was fast, and it, had, it, it did the processing for the recognition on the device. So that was one of our first decisions when we engaged, and then we got Jane involved, and Jane can probably talk a little bit more about the less technical aspect, but how we went about uh, making, uh, designing the app and making it user-friendly and, 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 and easy to use. Mm -hmm. um, one of the main Things, the most important things is that we want well, that everyone wants people to come in and engage, engage with the exhibit as it was on while we had time figuring out what to do. And so um, uh, one of the first things we tried to figure out was um, how to how to direct people to the objects that were going to be um, interactive and have a, an AR layer. And there are a few possible ways to do that. As Emily said, we couldn't modify the, the um, Pacific Exchange exhibit at all, so we couldn't put any kind of tags to notify people um, that there were some interactive objects. And, um, but fortunately, um, Emily decided to uh, use um, do it a little bit more as a treasure hunt, where you could look where you looked for animals in the exhibit, and so that way there was something for visitors to know which active which objects were active and um, and that worked well if you do that you have to make sure that all of the animals are interactive or someone might think it's not working um, and then in the train exhibit uh, there's it, we didn't have that same situation um, there you could have we could have put tags there in the future but um, for these first tests uh, we wanted to see how we could lead people to the object. And um, some of the things we tried or we thought about were maps or um, 
we even thought about some panoramic images. But this didn't really work well. People, not everyone is good at looking at maps, and um, the panoramas are very small on a device. So really what... Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, really what worked best, uh, we ended up having um, a hints a hints button that showed um, which objects were active that you could just call up and look at on a page. But um, to lead, so in our first test, the main thing people struggled with was just getting to the activities. Once they got, once they knew where to go, they held up the camera to their device and knew what to do, they could get a, um, an interesting interaction. Um, so if for future exhibits um, or for future apps, I think it, it is helpful if you can put some labels just to get people right to those objects if they want to when they're walking around the device. Um, and then just the one other thing I would say is that um, some of the, so the really successful interactions also, and Emily will probably want to say more about this, um, are ones that bring out something directly from the artifact, um, where you have an overlay that you're still engaging with the artifact itself. And then maybe you have, um, you can see it on the camera transform into something else, or something that's, um, it can't be done in the exhibit. Maybe you see the other side of it or things like that. So, um. so, so to summarize, I think if you consider yourself developing an IR, uh, an AR app, I think there are some decisions from the get-go that you need to consider. So the first of all is which platform are you using and what impact does that have on the cost? Because there's different platforms, different engines have different licensing arrangements. Some of them work with monthly or yearly uh, licensing fees. And then also from a technical point of view, there are um, these questions about recognition on the server versus recognition um, um, offline. And that has obviously impact on the infrastructure that you need to have in place. Um, Secondly, when you select this engine, uh, there are engines that are optimized for 2D, and then there's uh, uh, engines that are optimized for 3D recognition. So in this exhibit, we went with 2D recognition, meaning all the objects were flat, or graphics, or uh, stamps, or photos, and so forth. Uh, when we tried to apply that to a 3D object, it didn't work that well. So you need to have a 3D AR engine if you decide to have objects in your gallery, like, for example, you would want to pointed them this, at this water bottle, the angle that you're pointing at it matters, so you need a 3D engine. Um, and then um, in terms of recognition and accuracy of recognition, what helped us a lot was testing. So we tested a lot, and we found objects that are really easy uh, to recognize. So it had high contrast. Text, for example, surprisingly, didn't work that well, because again, the engine is not op optimized for text. So if you have high contrast images that, you can, that are standing out, that was always a good thing for recognition. And then the other thing that we were working with was also when objects are close together. So you have an object and you're um, getting probably, as you're walking around and you're holding your device up, you're getting both of them in a view. There is a, um, a quick reaction that the, the, the app could throw up both contents for both objects and you could get confused or something like that. So we were able to get around that um, just by having the app not recognizing small object, but small object in a larger content, like, for example, a small stamp in a larger photo of a letter or in a larger reproduction of a letter. So there's that to consider. And then, as Jane said, we think that augmented reality ultimately is really great if you can see the object while you're seeing the second layer of content pulled up. So it's a true AR experience. You're walking through, and while you're still looking at an object, at a photo, you have this other content uh, uh, coming up. We can do other things, and we did other things in terms of throwing up activities or bringing up activities or bringing up photos, bringing up additional content and things like that. But then you lose the connection to the place and to the object right there. So what we'd love to do is, um, and where we think this is going and where we'd like to do more is just overlaying content. As I mentioned. And that's it.
So I'll just talk a little bit more about how we chose the, the triggers and the assets and what the goal was there. Um, the whole goal for the app was to create a family-friendly app that would create an intergenerational conversation and encourage exploration, exploration of the objects in the galleries. Um, for the Pacific Exchange uh, exhibit, um, because they just made it through our new William H. Gross Gallery exhibit, they usually they very often will get to that space and kind of power through. Um, so we wanted to give them a reason to stop and look a little bit more um, and also make it more kid family friendly as well, which is why I chose the animal, something that's kind of universally understood by a lot of people and also because we couldn't do the orientation and or put anything inside the exhibit. So find all the animals. We target it as go on safari, find the animals, focus them on the app and watch them go wild. Um, also, I was at the zoo for three years before that, so it was something that I kind of just was comfortable with personally. Um, so, uh, and understood that kids like it. So, um, we started with that. Um, so again, all the animals inside the exhibit trigger something. Um, and we tried to find things that would allow the objects, which may not seem to have much to do, not to, to create the connections for the people. So if you don't know a whole lot about Chinese stamps, for example, especially at a kid level, you could still get some form of connection out of what was being portrayed there and make those connections on your own. Um, so a lot of the video uh, stamps that have animals on them will trigger um, videos of the animals in, in, in their natural environment. The panda stamps trigger the panda cam, which works really well with the panel there, which describes their relationship with Nixon and how we got the pandas to begin with. So then it shows the pandas at the National Zoo as they kind of completing that story. Um, it is very popular with Bow Bow on the screen anyways. Um, some of the other, one of the ones that we find to be most interesting to people is the one I have on the table for you guys. Is this um, actually I kind of grab one so I can share the screen? Is uh, this mask right here on the top? The um, lots of people think it's a dragon. It's in fact a lion. So when you put magnifier on top of this, a lion head pops up. I can get that through that. Oh, there we go. Um, and it's fun during the testing to be shattering people and having them go, oh, a lion popped up, but why did that happen? And hear them talk to one another and then read the panel to find out why. And be like, oh, because it's a lion mask, it's not a dragon mask. So it's really doing exactly what we're trying to get at. Make them look for the objects, find them, and then not just talk to one another, but read the stuff that's there to actually explain why things are inside the exhibit. Do you want to talk a little bit about how the train car was selected? So the objects in the so one thing that we haven't mentioned yet is that the um, China exhibit is a temporary exhibit. So it's only up for one year, um, which is one of the reasons why we felt we could pilot this project and sort of experiment with it and take risks with doing something that we hadn't done before because we knew that um, it was going to be temporary. Um, so um, in addition to Clara's involvement, my intern from last year, we also know that the train car is up for renovation and redesign in the next year. And so we're um, able to take everything that we've learned from um, developing the, um, the AR experience in that car and integrate it into our plan for renovating that car. Um, so that's one of the reasons, uh, just to give some more context mm -hmm. about our decision making. Um, in terms of selection, um, we had a lot of um, experimentation, um, as the folks from Quattrofoil pointed out, that um, some of those triggers that we had initially picked in the train car just weren't working. There's a nice big um, box, uh, lots of letter boxes, and they're just a bunch of squares all lined up to each other. And it was really hard to get that to trigger the experience. So we moved to specifically to, to the graphic panels, which are really strong and bold and black and white. Um, and they worked really well to trigger the same assets there. Um, so in terms of um, the train car and what we were trying to communicate, we really wanted people to um, make a stronger connection with the jobs that the people did in that car. Once again, the original origin of this was to get them uh, more emotionally involved. Um, and so we highlighted the triggers on the, the work that the workers would do in that train car um, and the objects that they would encounter and experience with. So a lot of the, we have five triggers in the train car, and a lot of them will pull up um, video footage of uh, postal workers doing the jobs in those train cars, so you kind of get the experience of what, they're, what they were doing there. Um, and then a couple of them just get you to explore the train car in ways that will help you reflect on the people that worked in that car at the time. Yeah. Um, and then as uh, was already mentioned, we did a bunch of evaluation on this. Um, uh, so first we did the map orient uh, example where we tried to get people to tell us how they best orient themselves. And we learned that neither map really works, so we just scrapped that all together. 
um, when we first did that test, um, they actually split even. But I think outside of context of the app itself, we were just asking utilizing that photo we showed you previously. It just didn't connect the dots to what was going on. And when we actually tested both of them um, in the first iteration of the app, that just confused everybody. And it was interesting to see that um, people had certain expectations for what these maps could do based upon things like Google Maps, where it shows you where you are inside the museum, and then we'll plot out where you are. And people were expecting that. They thought there was going to be a little blue dot that was mapping up through GPS, which is it was just an image <laughs> um, and not actually something that was interacting with them in that way. So we just got rid of that all together to eliminate that confusion. Um, and I think that was our biggest part takeaway from that first part is just we need to do a better job of explaining that this is based upon the objects and you're looking for these objects. Um, the second time we tested it out, um, we did a little less guidance. So that first time we shadowed people, we gave them the app, and if they just seemed confused, which everybody did immediately, they didn't. They were like, "This is a thing," and they just started running around the exhibit, having no idea what to do with it. Um, so the second, uh, we changed some of the words. So um, we made hints. Um, which showed a bunch of the um, targets. So it showed all the um, animal exhibits, animal objects, for example, if you hit hints, so that you would know to go to those things. Um, and that, that would show you some AR experience. But in those cases, people actually thought that, oh, I'm sorry, it actually said show me first. So the term was show me. And when you hit show me, it just showed the images of the objects that you should go find. So it's supposed to be kind of like an eye spy kind of situation of like, oh, here are the things, go find them. Um, unfortunately, people thought that show me meant well, I'm going to see a video that's demonstrating how this app will be used. And when that didn't occur, they started tapping on the images thinking something was going to happen. Um, so it's really, we learned a lot about terminology there. Um, the other part of that was that the originally the, um, the app said start and also had a line for a button for those show me hints. And people just hit start without looking or reading anything and just going for it and then getting really confused and frustrated. So we turn that word to I'm ready, and which seems to just make people feel more committed to the fact that they're pushing that button, um, that they're like, I understand, when using those words, I'm ready for a start. Um, so those are the big things that we took away. It was interesting, that second iteration of tests, people didn't, again, didn't quite understand what they were supposed to do with the app. But once they figured it out, they really liked it. So regardless of that frustration, they would all recommend it to their friends. They all want to see it in another exhibit. They all thought it was really cool and increased their engagement with the museum. So what we decided to do um, as part of the learning out process, um, we didn't mention before either, but this is an Apple-based product. Because we have 30 iPods inside our inventory, it's really easy for us to distribute them. Um, and we didn't have the funds to do both iOS and Android. So we picked the Apple products. So for anybody that doesn't have a smartphone or uses Droid, we have these iPods to rent out. Perfect. So we check them out. Um, um, we just require that their, I, that their IDs are given to us. Um, and then we give them back when they return the iPods. Um, so the volunteers are an integral part in getting this out there. Um, for anybody that rents out the iPod, we have a very structured manual, along with um, examples, to really showcase exactly how to utilize this app in that way. We assume at this point, anyways, that um, since we're not doing a whole lot of advertising with it, anybody who finds out about it, will be through our volunteers, who will again be able to demonstrate how this app is used. Um, we'll see how that goes from here on out. Um, our volunteers have been fantastic. They all seem a little overwhelmed, but um, really excited by where this is going and looking forward to trying to get more people involved. We've had four iPods rented since last Wednesday, so that's a pretty good sign, and people seem to be excited about yeah, what it's doing. Yeah, we haven't even heard of it. Yeah, so that's just people coming up to the volunteers and volunteers saying, hey, we have this, and four people being into it. So. Um, that's a pretty good start, too. Uh, do you want to do the OCIO Apple store conversation? Um, so when uh, we started this process, um, I didn't know, but it quickly became clear to me that I need to take it through the technical review board, um, which um, OCI run, oh, runs. Is anybody here on the technical review board? I don't think so. Um, Maybe people online are, but uh, forgive me if I talk about the process incorrectly. <laughs> but it was all sort of a learning process for me, so I just want to make sure when you are thinking about a mobile app to make sure that you get in touch with Jagesh Patel early on in the process. Um, and they meet once a month, it's the last Tuesday of every month, and do a review of all technical projects going through. And what became pretty clear is that they don't see a lot of apps in the TRB. 
Um, and because a lot of what um, we were presenting to do, they didn't quite have the processes set down for. So I think they're interested in developing those processes. Um, you know, they, they do an e-authentication e um, for anything that's using the website. So even though our um, app was going to be pulling from the website, no public was going to be going to that website. It was just the app that was going there. But we still needed to make sure that, that the website was all um, approved um, through OCIO. Uh, we had to do a privacy threshold analysis, the PTA, um, to make sure that we weren't collecting any personal data. Once again, even though the only interaction we were having with visitors was through that iTunes store, um, we still uh, wanted everything to uh, be approved through OCIO's channels. So right now their channels don't actually match with, um, with app publication. Um, but I think they're really interested in, in trying to figure out what those steps are. So I just um, rec recommend if you're doing uh, mobile app development that you're um, working through OCI on that process, especially um, with Nancy Proctor gone and work with Dixie Clough. Um, Dixie Clough publishes all of this. With, well, she's trying to be the major. No, not anymore. Um, she's about to see one of her time doing that. Right. Like the, the first one to go to. And Okay, so Valerie, Valerie was saying that don't recommend Dixie Club, so sorry, Dixie. Um, but, but OCI, she's not the go-to person, but it's important though that what the reason why we wanted to go through Dixie is that um, there are at, they we're trying to centralize the publishing of all the apps. Um, and so OCI was trying to figure out how to centralize the publishing of all the apps. And right now she's the owner of that central ability to publish. So that's what I want to get to see. I knew. <laughs> um, so just make sure that you're working um, because I think you can, right now there are too many, I think they're trying to manage and figure out how to um, corral all sort of the, the app in publications and making sure that the Smithsonian has their name on the product. So we didn't publish this as a Postal Museum product, we published it as a Smithsonian product through Dixie, which who's volunteering her time, <laughs> not the person to go to. <laughs> um, so um, the other thing that became clear is that um, Technical Review Board also required an evaluation plan. Um, and I'm an educator, so I interpreted that as making sure that we met with visitors mm -hmm. um, and that we had them um, evaluate and we created a strong project. And it turns out what they wanted was an evaluation plan based on the technical aspects of the app and how long it took to load and things like that. And so we didn't actually spend a lot of time testing those things beforehand. So I found out what they wanted from an evaluation plan was very different from what I thought of as an evaluation plan. So it was good to learn that after the fact. <laughs> yes, I think that's basically everything about the process that we went through. Um, I do have that visitor survey evaluation since we wrote something up, so if anybody is interested in that, I can share it with you happily. It should go somewhere. Um, otherwise, I don't have any other comments about the process. Does any question for us, Allison? Yeah, so if anybody has any questions. How are you planning on promoting it? Going soon? Yeah, I know Marty stopped by. Um, just questions. Um, so we're working with our communications department to create a, a PR um, push, right? and it's supposed to come out next week. Yeah, so we're, we're going to be doing a press release, um, and 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 the e blast. Um, we will be um, promoting it within the galleries um, with signage both at the information desk and in the two galleries where it's usable. Um, so although we couldn't change the signage on the walls, we are going to be able to put in um, signs there. Um, yeah. Any other suggestions for promotion? I, I think we, we feel like that may be our biggest hurdle, is letting people know that this is available. So if anybody has suggestions on that. One thing you might want to mention also is because we are using 2D triggers, um, images will trigger the app, whether they're the original object or whether they're on the web. So you're putting the, the uh, images on the web also so mm -hmm. people can, can try it. Yeah, we want, um, we want to have a, a, a place on the web where you can find all the images that trigger this um, so that somebody at home can um, get the same experience even though they're not in the galleries. If you weren't constrained by the inability to put anything in the exhibit space that would indicate uh, what could be triggered? 
how different do you think the, uh, the final output of this project would have been? Would it have been the same content? Would you have been able to do more interaction? Would you have been able to build it uh, more experiences into the exhibit with the same effort, or is it material? I think that. Uh, I think that the navigation, you know, because you can just basically say you put an icon next to the objects that have AR content associated with them. You could just put little tags around there, and then you can just the instruction is find where the tag is scanned, you know, and then point or something like that. So that would have been, from my point of view, uh, a big uh, help. And from a budgetary standpoint, I think this is probably not a fair project to look at because there really wasn't a budget, it seemed to me. What you guys were paid, I don't imagine actually covered what would have charged if you've done this in any other thing. That's probably true. Um, so don't approach this from the budget that they, they started out with. But given what the budget you were working with and what you're willing to do over your time, given the same amount of time, if you've been able to put stuff in the exhibit space, would there have been a much more of a volume of interaction? Well, the, thing, the thing is for us, once, once you have the uh, I'm going to say the basic functionality in the architecture of the app down. There's two types of content that you can present. Um, there's pre existing content, simple content like throwing up an image, linking to the panda cam. That is, from an effort point of view, relatively easy to do. Uh, what takes time is create original content, like create an AR layer, put the three, put the three, uh, that, that lion head up there. Um, creating that um, the digital app that or the, the section of the app that lets you go through the zone app. That's where a lot of the time goes because if you're creating original content. So um, I don't know if that answers totally your question, but that's where the, most of the effort goes. Once the app stands, once the structure of the navigation stands and to you know have a pop up somewhere. That's easy. If you have a pop up you can create the content that's very much that's very good. So the navigation isn't really related to the budget for navigation. Having the tags wouldn't be relevant. What you would spend more money on if you had it would be to make some 3 d animations, maybe something coming out of the um, object or rotating, things like that, just producing that. And what would you think of the difference in visitor experience? Would it be a better or worse or neutral or not different experience for the visitor having that constraint versus not having that constraint? I can't tell what my bias is. <laughs> but I think that the visitor, again, as we said earlier, the visitor experience is, from our point of view, better if you have that additional layer over there. Because you don't lose that connection to the object right there. You still see the object, and you have, while you're looking at the object, you additional information come up. So that would have been, I, I think that would make for a better, for, for a, a, a better visitor. I think it's just cooler, too. Okay, so the lion head on top of the mask yes. makes the it's not difficult on our end because that line is jerk. So, um, but it seems to produce a reaction because we're going to talk about that. Right. Um, but in regards to tags, I don't, I don't, we've always wanted it to be game like, especially since it was targeted towards children and their family. Um, I think with that part of the tags, we were able to integrate a type of game without being, and, you know, without having to put a whole lot more work into that. Um, it is kind of scattered to the hunt, like, since we're spying all the animals, in case we'll just go crazy looking for all of the animals. Um, which is it's nice that it was kind of integrated because it had to be. <laughs> I think if we could have done something more, we talked about doing like mission based and challenge based and really getting it to be more of um, I don't I don't know how it would the tags might have or may not have played into that, but there would have been more of a of a job on the player. Um, we really wanted to have to like do this to find that, to go to there, to go to here, and that was something we couldn't create. So it's going to be a step by step process. If you can figure out what the answer to this one is, then you can find the next one and then find the next one. But I mean, you in doing it in that way without having things inside the exhibit, if they can't find that next object, they're done. Um, so, by creating this in this manner, it could allow their game without it being too, too stressful. I hope. I, mean, I think, from the standpoint of just overall, a, AR is a technology to utilize. When it's done this way, where you're not allowed to do anything in exhibit, mm -hmm. that you then find yourself constrained to things such as if we're going to do a scavenger hunt, we have to make sure there's content for every animal. Because there's no way to say, well, look for the four animals. Well, I guess you could, but you have to get really specific. Right. As opposed to being able to offer any content. Instead of saying, okay, here's the content we have and the information we want to get across, you have to say, well, of this content, which stuff can we find a way to? 
let people know is there without touching the exhibit in any way. And in some respects, it seems to be one of the values of AR or any of the in exhibit um, experiences that are using the device that are going beyond what's in the exhibit. There's a question of, well, when you finish the exhibit and everything's on the wall, is that all the information you want to get across? And I think a lot of people have gone, okay, that exhibit's now being alone. Um, and if you say, well, no, we have lots of other stuff, but we couldn't afford to put screens everywhere. We didn't want to load it up with screens. We want people to carry a screen to present that information. You have to give people an easy way to know what, how to pull up the content related to an object. If you say you can't touch the exhibit, you are creating a, uh, experiences that are always ready to fail. And you're making it very hard to make an experience which can be successful and seamless for the, for the visitor because for some reason, we're not going to tell you where anything is. You've got to figure it out here. And so I think by uh, not having physical manifestation of the um, experience, you are crippling whatever it is you're trying to do. And there's one other related topic, I think, and that is um, being involved in development of this process during the exhibit development. Because another thing that we lost in the process was the ability to tie to the commerce culture and community themes that were in the exhibit. Um, because we were limited in not being able to put that in animals were the great way to engage the family audience. But whether or not there could have been more animals put in the exhibit early on, or m whether or not we could have thought and integrated more abilities to get to those major exhibit themes. Because right now, it's a wonderful way to explore the exhibition with a family audience, but it doesn't actually reinforce the curatorial themes at all of that exhibit. Um, and so there's a disconnect there. And that I think would have been resolved if we were developing this app while the exhibit was being developed, either by influencing them to add more animal content or for us to be more engaged with the, the three C's. And you're able to have that kind of lessons learned conversation with the museum so that the next exhibition that comes along, you guys can get in earlier? Yeah, I mean, th this was a, uh, this China exhibit had three different educators on it, so it was just a, a staffing turnover issue. So um, normally we're involved on, a, on an earlier basis, but um, I don't think we realized the scope of the development of this this app until Emily came on board and joined the team. So only six months before opening. I think even then we have to really get the curators or everybody on board to start with funding wise. Um, we were lucky enough to have some money for this, but I don't think <coughs> the money from the exhibit would. The exhibit budget did not, did not cover for this. Yeah, so, this was um, education fund. Right. So, in order to get the, that into the budget before we get started, I think would be the biggest hurdle to really overcome. Um, so, at this point, we're trying to see how this works out. We're trying to get everybody on board and then um, see what to do with the next. Um, I know personally, I would love to see it be integrated into wherever the brain exhibit is inside that, that space down there. Um, I think it would just be a fun way to just. As an advertising tool, also, and every time you update this, it has the new exhibit in it, and then you know that when you come, you're going to get some more experience in the, in the app. Um, the next exhibit in that space is. Uh, well, it's still the final Yeah. Yeah, it has a lot to do with um, African American and their experience going through flattering. Um, and thinking about the way we really tie in um, just on the most basic of level, that seems pretty obvious. Some of the snaps, so some of the snaps that we on it have him pop up or a speech that he was doing, get some of that audio and those visuals in there without having to complicate things a bit further. I think that would be a better way of getting that content from curators' ideas into it from the start, too. Um, yeah, but I think funding would be the biggest issue for us to make sure everything's going to be done. Sounds like you give you a lot of very cool things. Um, what were some of your major, three primary outcomes, and how are you expecting to measure those? Um, so, our primary outcomes was um, honestly pretty vague. Um, we knew we wanted to be, uh, um, but basically, it was a way for um, intergenerational uh, people to in group to have conversations, to group conversation, and experience um, That was, we really wanted to see those groups of people that have. Very easy to have something they can communicate together with. Um, also, to give children a way to explore this exhibit either inside a means that was comfortable mm -hmm. to them already, um, since the three C's commerce culture and community may not, with, the, with what we had to work with, is not easily acceptable to that younger age group. Um, so, we look at the animals for that. Um, we have evaluations that we have printed up. We haven't started on. The goal is that um, anybody can write out their icon. Will utilize this um, evaluation form 
they wait to do goes to volunteer to make the issue an open app or all the information is offered under the evaluation form. So we'll come up with that way. So the questions that you're asking are, are they just um, time spent satisfaction and that sort of thing? Uh, the ones that we have right now um, talk about the, the group, what they consist of. Um, and then we get into um, questions like, um, was it easy to use? Um, did this prompt your interest? Um, did the videos graphic the text prompt your interest? Did it um, increase your engagement with these units? Did you more confident than you thought that you would have? Um, did it spark conversation about the artifact and exhibit within your group? Um, did you have fun coming here? Um, and then we get into the, would you be interested in doing staff and other proceedings and exhibits? Or would you recommend this? And specifically, we're um, we're looking at the answers to those questions in conjunction with the group type. Yeah. So, um, and, and looking for engagement um, more, you know, we're more interested in, in how the families use the device mm -hmm. in their school. So that's interesting. It's specifically the question about fun. What, mm -hmm. what, what do you expect to get from answers from? I think um, it'll be interesting to see, really, um, if they find it fun. I know it's a very um, it's hard to judge what will first of all find fun here for the other um, in understanding that. Uh, interestingly enough, most people said agree. Um, and we unfortunately were unable to really find a group that had a lot of kids while doing this part of the evaluation, which is a detriment to some of our, our studies, that every group that we encountered were adults. And they had some different um, issues with utilizing the app than anybody that had with kids in previous evaluations. So this is our second iteration in our um, they, they got it. Um, it was um, the process to really get the understanding was slower. Um, so for them to come across and say it was still kind of fun, it would be seen as a positive. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of a arbitrary term. Well, yeah, that's just interesting because usually that's not all that the things we leave in the exam and just to say it wasn't fun. It's usually you should find something. Or something. Yeah. So it's interesting that you're trying to. Yeah. Not at the post. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have um, we measure uh, visitor experience on five different qualities. Um, did you have fun? Did you learn something? Um, were you well oriented? Did you feel welcome? And did you feel safe and comfortable? So those are sort of our five standards for a positive visitor experience. So um, when we're looking at evaluating different parts of the experience, we figure out which five of those things are critical. And this is definitely in the in the fun and learning channel. Was this just solely a, um, with the education? Or did you work with your exhibits folks like that and developed anything in there? Other departments? Um, we worked with the web um, department, um, building mm -hmm. a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of um, getting the assets online um, on our end um, and, um, and web and PR to, to promote the object. But um, once again, because we were doing the work after the exhibit was completed, um, we didn't work specifically in the team based environment. Our curator also she retired here yeah, in March. <laughs> have to get it open, but she was really excited about it. She wanted to see something fun and different, and she was really excited to see that we were trying to do that. But she wasn't around to open it for herself. And our exhibits department is down to one person right now, so <laughs> he was busy with other projects. <laughs> and we just opened a new exhibit on Thursday, so it was pretty fun. Do a similar app for a phone call? It's also a big difference. Uh, you know, our app is based on the title. It's kind of interesting that you guys were faced with a lot of the same limitations and the same questions that we were, and it just kind of light bulb went on my head. You know, we could have shared our yeah. results with you before, <laughs> so you didn't have to go through all that. Um, I'm just thinking of the, it must be some one of us sharing information, especially yeah. like the evaluation stuff. Mm -hmm. I know there's a device for that stuff too. So yeah. if you're interested in that, there's more pushback in our different museum about doing that. Uh, then we we'll show some data that I would share. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question was just gonna how can we do that for that? I'm yeah. sure there are other projects that I would think that would be something. Mm -hmm. What's the pushback? Um just logistics, I'm looking at we're a totally different beast and <laughs> crazy million kids. You know. um, so there's a lot of things about handling that amount of volume, about abuse and the loss of devices. And what's really interesting to me is I was told that we can't collect personal information. So it seems like you guys are getting away with it. So we're not we're not we're not writing down like that for everything. 
keep it on copy of the UI. Yeah. We were told that we can use well, keep it on copy, but they're taking it and we hold it. When you bring the device back, you have your ID back. So that's how you make it come back. But there's, oh, you're saying you can actually physically yeah, take people's personal data. Okay. You were yeah. advised. Then, well, you mean, when you say data, you mean taking hold of people's property. I think that's confusing whether you're saying getting their data or getting their property. Getting the license is getting their property and you handle a piece of property and you're exchange at the end. Getting their data is writing it all down and saying, okay, now I know where you live and now I have a phone number and yeah. take off this. And the, the question is whether or not taking their property implies that you could take their data. Well, I guess really the question is what is the prohibition of the museum? Is it taking their property or is it taking their data? It yeah. sounds like you're saying data. Right. Well, I don't know. I think for me, I got the idea of both. You worked with, yeah. Yeah. We can. Uh, yeah, we work with the Native American museum, you know, in store, and also thinking about how security takes ID when they're wearing out the wheelchair. So and it is volunteer or staff person when we are doing the app rental, or we just interpret it as it's a so basically, you just an extension of what you're already doing. If you get out of a wheelchair, you leave. We give you a, uh, we give you a piece of our property. You give us something of yours as security, and we just move right across with that. What's the time frame for your project? Well, it's rolling out. I think sometime in the summer. Same thing. I don't think we're going to distribute devices just because we don't have a number of devices. So it's just going to be minimal signs that they're going to ask about it. Just is in the hall and other people to the fact that we can download it. I'm a little bit skeptical about that because it's such a huge download. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much maxed out. Because the, 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 there's a lot of media and the, the, the 3D information is pretty detailed. So, it's, uh, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Is it for Apple and Android? Right now, it's only for Apple and it's because we just didn't have enough funds to download. What do you do? Uh, I take it you're kind of focusing on it's a family group, a parent provides a license, and you give them a, a, a device. Whereas you guys are in the face with 30 kids and one teacher, and the teachers can't yeah, the yeah, responsibility for 30 devices. Right, and, yeah. Yeah. Of minors and who leaves the information. Yeah. We do have, you can check out multiple devices with one ID right. at this right. point. So. Yeah, we're going to. But yeah. not 30. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have our desktop with 10. Yeah. And I guess the, the thing is, if it's a parent and three kids, mm -hmm. that's one thing. If it's a teacher and 30. even 15 right. or 30 kids, it's the issue of, well, here are your 29 year devices. I don't know what happened to your 30th one well, giving you my license. Right. Right. That's, you don't want to ever be in that situation. <laughs> or chaperones turning in IDs for kids they don't even know. <laughs> Do you have some sort of replication set up where you kind of push an update to all, all the time? Yeah, Kim Muriel <laughs> um, yeah, doesn't work on Mondays, but she is um, oversees all the tech upgrades and stuff like that. But I think she just does it one by one at this point. So. Mm -hmm. And Apple does have a product for that, and it just gets me the moment. But yeah. it's specifically for managing multiple devices and keeping them all. Why like, can let you in the game group early if you're cool. If people are actually putting data into it, you can let everything back out and start everything next month. Do you guys have Wi Fi in your gallery? I was going to just mention that. So we have Wi Fi, um, and these are all hooked up to the guest Wi-Fi right now, and they're locked. So we have these locks in the app. can't go off of them. So anybody that writes this iPod can only put it in the app, and it's on guest. And on guest, because for whatever reason, on visitor, the data can doesn't pop up when we do that trigger. Um, so whereas we were starting to encourage people to download, to get on the visitor Wi-Fi in order to download, um, we're finding that they don't get a complete experience, and it comes up and there's a, a playback error. So we're going to have to go to to see it. There's something going on there, or um, the next lecture we need to talk more with our communications department. Um, so in the meanwhile, we're not recommending that people who are downloading it themselves use our Wi-Fi at that time. Just because, yeah, for some reason, the all the other video links work, but the Panic Cam, um, you get an error message. Yeah. But the Panic Cam, it's, it's a live stream. Everything else is just a video yeah, off right. the server, mm -hmm. so they need to open ports to the live stream. Yeah. And so SI, SI Visitor doesn't let you open those ports, I guess, but SI yeah. Guest does. Right. So you're streaming everything via the uh, web connection to the device, or is there stuff that's stored on the device? Well, so, all the videos stored on I guess the issue with Visitor and streaming is that they basically don't want people to come here. They don't want to see Netflix and start watching Netflix, mm -hmm. and so they're filtering out 
all streaming. My question is, keep getting just open up, but okay. it's probably flash now on the campaign, so it's probably the same as everything else. So maybe not. Yeah, maybe some assign that web address. I don't know. We'll put we'll, yeah. in we'll, we'll we'll the request. Um, yeah. When people are using the data plans, it looks like. So yeah, that's but what we're forcing everything We did make a decision early on about not having the app be too big. Um, yeah. and, and having a, a, the, because we had the SI um, wireless anywhere here that we felt like we could easily ask people to continue to stream. Mm -hmm. And that's something you need to test in your, in your organization, in your building, because, you know, if you're getting to stream and your Wi-Fi is paying them, it just becomes. Yeah, I think that was the reason why the Wi-Fi is pretty bad. And we tested it off-site and on-site so we can use it. That was maybe another, you know, another thing that really I would encourage everyone to consider the, to allow a lot of time for testing on site, both with the objects in CT and also with the infrastructure on you if you have to do dependent on uh, connections. So there's no, no way around that. You can prep the app and, you know, where we are in our studio, you can program it and test it, but you have to do the site and try it out. Because a lot of times, what we also found there are Specifically in the train car, there are physical restrictions. You hold it up and you need to be that close or that far away for the image to be recognized or for the object to be recognized. So there's physical constraints that you're not aware of if you just test it with a different mm -hmm. So it's definitely worthwhile um, testing. And then a glass on the cases from, you know, there were just a lot of differences between just a straight cut. The lights are in the window in the afternoon, and when everything works in the afternoon, all it sees is clear, the reflection off the glass. So. But the angle, some of the um, the World's Fair images are, I think, at an angle like that, which is a little different. And that was something else we were thinking about is um, child height um, and where our objects are displayed and trying to figure out. And, and I think in the case we did work, though, that something's high up, it can still be right from this angle, um, which is just something that. And even the uh, point about uh, if you have objects close together and then um, triggering the wrong thing, we didn't discover right away until at our um, studio we set up, um, I set up the images, arranged them the way they were in the case. I took a photo of the case and tried to duplicate that. And then we saw that um, the Zodiac images were close together. It's not going to take it, it just keeps triggering and keeps re-triggering and triggering. Debugging, it's just like debugging and testing it out. It's just more The scavenger hunt, did that, you landed on that particular game over selfie or what other, what other uh, you know, AR options are there for you? Yeah. Um, is it scavenger hunt the, the main? <laughs> Use of AR and the scavenger hunt arises because we had to move the selection of options, objects that we wanted to make active. So you can have other uh, AR layers where you just where everything's active, where you have pointers and walk around and you get directions. But then you need to uh, install them, you need to have positional referencing so you know where you are in relation to the uh, object as well. That's another thing. So just Moved into this direction, you know, you have a, a handful of objects that you're looking for, and then you have a grand. Well, here it's called. I mean, what other game? I mean, what other. Well, you can tell. Uh, some use of the rules other than uh, scavenging. Well, when you mentioned selfies, I mean, you can do some really fun things, but it's um, <laughs> like taking a picture of yourself and putting it in a scene, things like that. This is basically a budgetary thing. You have to do it very quickly and really just do some basics. Um, well, because I mean, selfies are what everybody wants to use. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that's what people would say that the use of the mobile tech and tools in the different spaces is kind of like that's the main use for scavenger hunts, I guess it makes sense. To, to yeah, there's a record, you know, there's a lot of other things you can do um, recording where you've been and, and um, you know, social, using it on social media, and there's, you know, you can go pretty far with the interactions and using photography in the camera. And that was something we had talked about at some point. I was talking about selfies in the train car with a uh, male clerk behind you kind of thing. Um, but again, it was mostly the budget issues mm -hmm. and the uh, communication. Mm -hmm. 
the only thing that we were considering is that we just wanted to see if this is something that would work in concept in this museum. Is this something that anybody that comes to the local museum will want to bother with at all? Um, so before we could spend more money or get all the people from the entire museum to do this, we just had to see if we have an app for people to download it. Um, still keeping it you know, in the frame of family friendly. Um, we've been saying that our target age group is like 8 to 12 kind of thing with kids keeping the iPod on their own and exploring with an adult. Um, but an American Indian without any evaluation, just they have some temporary exhibits that tend to be portrait based, so there might be 30 portraits in there. And so using AR, we can make every portrait a trigger, which is no big deal. You just need to snap a good picture of each one of the portraits, and the lighting's the same in there all the time. And then on some of them, you could hold it up and we would videotape the, uh, one of the tour guides talking about. That person giving information that was on the label about their history that actually the volunteers, the staff members in education went did research on the shows. They then would stand in front of the picture and give that uh, presentation. We tape it so we hold it up in front of the uh, picture. The whole image changes over to her standing in front of the picture so you now don't have to hold it up anymore. So in some respects you're engaging with it but then you don't have to go like this for two and a half minutes. You can actually take it down and she's still standing in front of the picture. Other ones you hold it up into the sides of the uh, image, you had the opportunity to see other images of that person. And all this stuff was all, I went out on the web and found other pictures of these chiefs with their family instead of the portrait was taken. So you'd see the chief, get a live image of the chief, and then went down the side, you'd see all these family portraits in the back of their home, their tower, whatever else. Tap any of those, and you get those full screen. Um, there was a video, a picture of uh, Roosevelt's inauguration, which was his final big picture in the exhibit. Um, the Library of Congress had video or film that had been shot probably from about six feet to the right where that photo was taken. So I just pulled that off YouTube and pointed the picture, at the still picture, and you get the video of the exact same scene to place. So there's lots of stuff you can do with overlays that are really yeah. simple to achieve. It's really that issue of being able to let people know what in the exhibit they can work with. And that's why I did an American Indian where I knew, all right, there are 30 things in here. They're all flat. They're all the same height, and I can find content for all of them. So I don't have to say it's that one and this one and not these four. Very relevant to tell you that I'm sure I'm aware of that, but there's other opportunities if we just think of interpretation in different languages or something. I think you want to play as well. I think we're completely into interpretation of the area in many languages. Well, I mean, it really is welcome to the exhibit to explore. Um, download that fire if you have it. Um, or we have iPods if you like to grab one. That reminds me yeah. with the name. I, I'm finding with more and more of these names, like Curious, I just don't get how anybody's supposed to ever find the website and you have no clue how it's spelled with Magnifier. <laughs> it's not Magnifier the way it would be spelled. Right. I, I typed it in with a Y and then put an AR after it. Um, how are you? Is there any expectation that you can say it in a way that someone will know what they should look for? Is it when you write it down for you or let me tell you how it's spelled? Uh, well, fortunately, you can take a physical museum that comes up so, or NPM, so that also just really takes care of it when you're uh -huh. the Apple Store. Um, otherwise, we just would say magnify AR um, to make that point. But yeah. It's, I think the problem with people with magnify is people assume it's a Y rather than a Y. Yeah, that's a good point. That's really yeah. magnify AR. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah, so I'm going going to just happening more and more often. Yeah, like going to the Apple Store is something. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. you know, it's a good point. You know, it's one of these websites when you have a radio app, you need to spell it because otherwise people will see it wrong. Yeah. You know, That's a very good point. They're curious. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank